in this session, Stafford explains what cybernetics is really about. It tells the story of how it all began by relating extraordinary stories about extraordinary people. This very personal account conveys the excitement that surrounded the origins of the subject, starting with the first informal collaborations in Mexico City in 1943. The story continues to unfold through the Macy Foundation meetings of 1946 to 1953, and covers the period up to Stafford's travels in America, published in his Reflections, American Diary, 1960. All the main characters are introduced, including Warren McCulloch, who became Stafford's mentor. The dangers of reductionist thinking are discussed and contrasted with the counterbalancing holistic view that provides synergy. Specific attention is given to the distinctive quality of interdisciplinary thinking, to the concept of intrinsic regulation as the whole essence of cybernetics and the answer to why so many social systems fail. Well, it's very, very nice to meet you all. I hope you all relax and enjoy, seem to be enjoying each other's company, which is very nice. Now, I, um, I expect you know that there is a, an institution which, to the shame of the country's concerned, is still very much in existence, which is called Death Row. Mm. Well, there was a, a prison governor who sent the three men from Death Row to tell them their time had come. And uh, there they were, three men. And he said to them, look, uh, I wish to take a note of your last requests. And turned to the first man. The first man said, well, I'm a, a Catholic and I've not led a very good life and I would like to see a priest. Okay. How about you? <clears throat> Second man said, well, I'm professor of cybernetics. I would like to give my last and definitive lecture on the subject, what is cybernetics? I think that can be arranged. Third man, <laughs> and you? He said, uh, I'm a doctoral student of the professor here. I want to be executed second. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know if you've tried to find out ever what cybernetics is, but you will get some very odd stories because I, I, I think you will see by the time we've finished why, the, why it is. And in trying to introduce this subject to you, rather than plunge into... Uh, academic definitions, I would like to tell you the story of how this all began. Now, there's some very extraordinary people involved in this, and I had the very great privilege of knowing all of them, and there aren't many of us left. So I'm very happy to share this with you, and I want to try and impart some of the excitement that went with the origins of this subject. Now, there aren't many sciences that, that you can date. You know, when did physics start? Nobody knows. The cybernetics quite specifically started in 1943, which is a little more than 50 years ago, you realize. And the war was on. Now, the first man I want to introduce to you is, his name is Norbert Wiener. Has anybody heard of him? Well... You see, one of the things that all these characters I'm going to produce for you have in common is that they were world authorities in their own subject. Now, that's a very unusual situation. And it meant that they were not defensive. They were not having to prove anything. Whereas most of us, unfortunately, are always on the defensive and always trying to prove something because we are insecure. And our society is like that, I think you might agree. Well, these guys, not so. Now, Norbert Wiener was one of, I suppose, the six ranking mathematicians in the world. He was very, very famous. And he... This is 1943, right? So the war is on. He is drafted to the task of doing something about anti-aircraft fire. I don't know if you can imagine what it was like, what aeronautics was like 50 years ago, but, you know, you've got an aeroplane there, and you, you're going to try and hit it, so you, you say, oh, well, I'd better aim off a bit. 
I mean, that was roughly the state of the art. It, it, it must be unthinkable to you now that that could have ever been the case. But uh, Wiener had the, had the problem of how to, how to track uh, an aircraft, which is probably dodging around, and, and there's the whole problem of whether if you were the aircraft, you'd take defensive action or what the hell you would do. Now, in support of him, he's got his knowledge of mathematics. Now, why was he famous? Well, I don't think there are any mathematicians here, are there? But he uh, was the, the man who developed Fourier analysis. Um, it's, it's a way of looking at a time series uh, of something, some function developing over time, which is very, very complex and involves, therefore, prediction of the next terms, and you can immediately see why, without knowing anything about the mathematics, why this should be relevant to the task of uh, shooting down an aeroplane. So there he is. Now, <clears throat> he has a very great friend whose name is Arturo Rosenbluth, a man I've never met. I met his son who was quite old, even then, who was the head of uh, ne neurophysiology in the, in the University of Mexico, in Mexico City. And these two men became great friends. And one of the things that became obsessive, I mean, he's a mathematician. What, what, what's he know about uh, neurophysiology? And what does a neurophysiologist about, know about mathematics? I can tell you nothing in both cases. And they began to get very interested in the question of what the other was doing. And they came to a very extraordinary arrangement whereby they spent six months of every year in each other's company, alternately at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where Wiener was, and in Mexico City, where Rosenbluth was. And out of this it began to emerge most fruitful collaboration. As, as you'll hear. So that's Norbert. Now, it's a most propitious year, this is 1994, to be talking about Wiener because it is his centenary in November. And I've been much concerned with uh, organi organizing a celebration of his, uh, his centenary. Uh, I've, I've bought a photograph of this fellow. Uh, out of my, I raided my personal album here. This is Norbert. Many, many tales attached to this extraordinary person. Now, you know, extraordinary people are, I suppose, extraordinary. You can expect it. And um, he became very famous for the story about walking across the quadrangle at um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and um, and encountering a student who said, excuse me, professor, I wonder if I could ask you this. Yes, my boy, yes, whoops. And when he'd finished, he, um, he said to the student, oh, excuse me, which way, was, which way was I walking when, I, when you stopped me? And the student said, you were going over there, sir. And he said, oh, good, I've had lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so th th this is the sort of story that circulates. He, he lived in a really rarefied atmosphere, did Norbert Wiener, and... Uh, uh, I can't, I can't tell you how how marvelous a person he was. He 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 was often he is, is often called the American Leibniz, and some of you will have heard of Leibniz, I hope. The the uh, philosopher, who was notorious for being a polymath, you know, who knew everything. And people often say you can't do a Leibniz these days because there's too much to know, which I dispute. However. The, the, the story about Norbert, which I'm sure isn't true, but I'll tell anyway because it gives the flavor of the man, is that when, when his family grew up, or his first family grew up, um, he moved house in Cambridge, Massachusetts, to a smaller house to accommodate his, uh, his smaller needs. And uh, when he left the university, his wife sort of uh, said goodbye, Norbert, and don't forget we're moving today. So he says, I'm oh, hush woman, yes, I know that. But nonetheless, he comes back to the house. And uh, the lock's been changed, and the curtains are drawn, and uh, my God, we've been burgled, you know, this is all. And he's, oh God, no, we've moved. And he's close by, you see, just a smaller house. Where have we moved to? 
So he stopped a little girl riding by on a bicycle and said, excuse me, my dear, the Wieners used to live here. Do you know where they've gone to? And she said, yes, Daddy. <laughs> so that puts him on the map, and there he is in Mexico with Rosenbluth, right? Now, the next person I want to introduce is called uh, Warren McCulloch. I've got him, and he's very, very special to me because he became my mentor. And that's very alarming-looking Warren, who, who was nothing if not dramatic. Uh, Warren McCulloch, if asked by ladies in cocktail parties what he did, would always say a blacksmith. And he was a very good blacksmith. He was also a physician and was, lived next door to Einstein, who was one of his closest friends. And they were, um, they also, please note what is emerging here, you see. Einstein's a physicist. This guy's a physician. And somehow they, they are recognizing each other. And in that very year, 43, when uh, I'm discussing where Wiener turned up in Mexico, Warren persuaded the New York Academy of Science to hold a meeting which he called Teleological Mechanisms. Now, what's teleology mean? <laughs> what's that case? <laughs> Purpose, did you say? No, what did you say? Causes. Causes, yeah. Uh, Telos is Greek for end. So it's, it's, it's ends. It's where are we going? Now, a teleological machine would be a machine with a purpose, which is an odd concept straight away, you see. So here he is holding this, uh, this meeting. Now, in those days, and we're going to hear some more of this, it was very common for leading uh, people to get together in sponsored meetings, which were sponsored by foundations or whatever. And we don't seem to do that any longer. They aren't the funds. But a lot of the interdisciplinary ideas, which is obviously what we're beginning to talk about here, came up because of putting, putting really distinguished people together who would then try and discuss things. So uh, that was what Warren was doing. Now, Wiener's works have been published uh, I think in two volumes and there's a biography of him by, by a chap called Masani who is a mathematician Warren's works have just come out in four volumes and it's just amazing to see the, the, the scope of what he covered in his life he, he was the country's leading expert on nerve gases for instance uh, he was uh, all manner of things the Chicago Literary Society invited Warren to go and talk to them, and I, I guess they expected him to explain what science was all about in words of one syllable. So he didn't. He read them his poetry. <laughs> it shook him. <laughs> and that little book, which is called The Natural Fit, he wrote in the front of that to me uh, a sentence of four lines. I'm, tr I'm desperately anxious to share the, these people with you, these personalities. Here, here goes with four lines, which I don't think have ever been published. And it's just one sentence, but it's long. Okay, you ready? <laughs> it says, Since of that loveliness I know is you, which in quick having holds me quite content, love could not gather what had never grown, or what from my poor gardening never grew. I to the frenzy of an immortal few turn hungry home. <laughs> and you like that? So that's Warren. Now, Warren and Norbert were friends, eventually fell out, as always seems to happen. But at that time, they were friends. And so, Gradually, around this nucleus, various other people got sucked in. And pretty well every subject you can think of was represented with people who were authorities, therefore not scared, therefore willing to expose themselves to this kind of chit-chat. 
And at this point, we get the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation moving in, in an absolutely historic move to me. They sponsored a cybernetic conference among these leading people. There are about 20 of them every year for 10 years. And that is the foundation of cybernetics, those, those conferences. All sorts of people were sucked into that. Um, now, I've mentioned uh, mathematics, physiology, uh, medicine. Try uh, anthropology. Can anybody name an anthropologist? Got it. Thank you. I'm so glad someone got it. <laughs> That's, uh, that's Margaret, a, a very, very redoubtable woman. I'll tell you a story about her, man. She, um, she told me this herself, so bound to be true. Um, Churchill in the war was very concerned about the behavior of the American troops in Britain. And they were running amok. Uh, at least that was the popular belief with, with the local girls uh, while the local boys were in Burma and places like that. And he asked Roosevelt for somebody to investigate this. And Roosevelt sent Margaret Mead to Churchill. And she looked into this and you know, it, it's quite an interesting little thing. See, the, the belief in England, I was a young man at the time, and uh, I was part of this belief system <laughs> that, that Americans were paid about six times as much as, as we were in the army and, uh, and could walk off, and they had collars and ties on their uniforms, and we still had these buttoned up, they clipped up things. So we thought we hadn't got an equal chance at all. Now, what, what Margaret discovered was that the American soldiers were chatting up English girls and they said to them, will you come to bed with me? Now, it seems that this is a compliment to a woman of those days in the American culture. It was a way of saying, I, I think you're lovely. You see. English girls thought it was a proposal of marriage. <laughs> it's a different cultural stint, you see. So they said, oh, yes. The Americans then said to each other, these English girls are a pushover, and what? <laughs> now, this is an explosive system we're talking about here. So that's Margaret. She got in on this, this group, and McCulloch became the chairman of the group, and um, all sorts of people tried to get in on the bandwagon, and then McCulloch was absolutely fascist about the thing. He wouldn't let anybody in who he didn't think was, was right. In other words, he was looking for the interdisciplinary balance, and he managed to sustain that for all these 10 years of meetings. And then what had such an impact, you see, on anybody who was actually studying these matters was that they, they were all published. The, uh, the conference proceedings were published year after year after year, and these little green books had begun to accumulate with me. I was amazed. Now, into this group had come a young Austrian scientist called Heinz von Forster. Now, I'd introduced you to him. And after the Anschluss, where the Germans took over Austria. Uh, they uh, hijacked all the leading scientists. And the result was that Heinz von Forster was the man who invented airborne radar for the Germans. See, well, now he's, uh, he's appeared in, in the United States, and he doesn't speak much English at all, but he's there. Now, these, these guys needed someone to take on the task of editing the conference for publication. And Warren, with a stroke of typical stroke of genius, nominated Heinz von Foster to do the job on the grounds that he would then have to learn English. <laughs> this is 
This is exactly the truth of the matter, and that's what happened. And I've got Heinz here, I'm sure I have. In the back, yeah. That's Heinz von Vorster, who is a mercurial um, Viennese man. Who, um, he, for years I'd known him, and he was often talked about Uncle Ludwig. And Uncle Ludwig became some kind of character to me, you know, who was, who was an odd chap, the subject of many anecdotes. And it's just ages before I discovered that Uncle Ludwig was in fact Wittgenstein. <laughs> You've heard of him, I take it? Ha <laughs> ha, some of you haven't. Some of you have. Wittgenstein is a very, very famous philosopher who worked with Bertrand Russell at Cambridge. So I really uh, despair of giving you a, a proper glimpse of Heinz von Forster, but I'll tell you one little story about him. He said to me, Stafford, you are forgetting my first theorem. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm sorry. Um, first theorem, I'm sorry. I'm awfully sorry. I don't know what it is. You don't know my first theorem, he said. <laughs> so... He then told me his first theorem, which is the more the, the more profound the subject that you ignore, the greater your chance of fame and success. <laughs> it's a very, very deep remark, don't you think? Hmm. So there they are. There's this gang, some of these people I've introduced to you. So what did they get up to? Well, all of them were working on war work. All of them arrived and came and went to the center of this activity in Mexico City because that was a neutral country, you see. And uh, they hadn't got their spouses with them, and they talked a lot at night. And they began to focus on this uh, this question. Suppose that the things that matter most to science, to philosophy, to human race, are issues which fall between the stools of the established subjects. Now don't forget, they're, they're all experts in their own fields. So, they don't have to defend anything. So they started talking about what sort of things aren't really accounted for in the university. Now, university means universal, it's supposed to mean that it's universal, that it is holistic. And you couldn't find a more reductionist and non-holistic place, as some of you have probably discovered, and others will. I mean, it's, it is absolutely appalling. You can have two professors, eminent professors of soil ecology in adjacent laboratories looking at the same sample of soil, and they, they can't talk to each other about it because he's got this slant on it and he's got this slant. And as to the expert on seaweed down the corridor, I mean, it's always. And this is, this is really how science has developed. Now, I don't know if you really thought about that, and I want you to because... Who says that God knows the difference between physics and chemistry? Now, this is what we, we know as reductionism. Our whole intellectual apparatus is based on reductionism, which means taking things apart and reducing them and studying the bits. And, of course, this, this trick has paid off very, very well, hasn't it? You know, it's given us an atom bomb, for instance. The, the point is that in doing that, you may be losing all the results of the interaction of the parts. Now, look, suppose you take a wireless set apart and you're knowledgeable about electronics. And you say, well, this is a capacitor, and this is a resistance, this is this, this is an amplifier. <laughs> There's, that counts for the radio set, doesn't it? Okay, so where is the Guns and Roses noise? I don't see this. You take a, a, an engine apart, and you have pistons and all this jazz and fuel injectors and just fine. What is most characteristic about this engine is its speed. 
no speed anywhere to be seen. So I'm trying to show you that there, there are terrible traps lying in wait for us when we use this reductionist method, powerful as it is, and I don't want to disparage it, except that we've lost the counterbalancing holistic view which tries to put the pieces together again and which gives us the benefits of what, I don't know if you know this word, you know synergy, which is the energy available from the syn, S-Y-N, uh, <laughs> putting things together. Now, this was all very clear to these guys in 1943. They began to, to, to agree that this was the case, and they started actively to consider what sort of topic might pervade everything and not be recognized because of this reductionism. And they came up with the notion of control. Now, if you put on any hat as a scientist, as an artist, as a citizen, you were going to have some views on control, aren't you? Politics is all about control and what kinds of control we think are and are not acceptable. Administration is all about control of a different, different sort. Is it different? If you're an astrophysicist and you wanted to talk about control, well, there's gravitation. Pretty strange the way all these solar systems go round their suns and so on. That's a form of control after all, isn't it? If you were a brain surgeon, you would be saying, well, the reason you've lost your uh, feeling here is because of something here, which is a control circuit. So, so these guys realized that all of them knew a hell of a lot about control. <laughs> and as soon as they started analyzing it, they realized that they didn't know the same thing. And, the, the, you know, the politician meant something different from the physicists, and the physicists meant something different from the brain man, and so forth. So they said, well, what gives perhaps control is something that we should really examine in its own right. Now, one of the... This, of course, is what became cybernetics. Now, one of our problems here is that because we all have different views of what control is, to some people, the very word is like a red rag to a bull because it suggests, uh, you know, you do this or else. I mean, the very word has this in its connotation, which isn't very useful. So these guys started meeting on a regular basis and trying to discuss what they meant by control. And all of them have attested in their various writings that it took them about three years to know what they were all saying because they would pick on some guy one night and say, just explain what control is to an astrophysicist. So I mentioned gravity, then there's cosmic radiation, and there's all sorts of peculiar things going on there. And then somebody else would have a go, and it took them all this time to understand each other. But the more they understood the more they perceived identity, the more they realized that there were common features to all of this. Now, that is astonishing, isn't it? Because we have been taught the difference between our subjects and our ways of looking at the world, and we don't know how to put them together, and suddenly somebody comes along and says, well there are unifying things that are working across here. Well, now, the story I want to tell you now is not, not so much uh, of a jokeable thing as, as my earlier stories, because I think that this should give you the, the real flavor of this thing, and what I'm going to tell you is high science. And I really want you to hang on to it because it gives me a frisson every time I think about this story. And if it doesn't give you a frisson, maybe you shouldn't have come. <laughs> There's a challenge, isn't it? 
I'm going to pad with me here. <laughs> Sorry, what was What's the first one? Oh, I see. <laughs> 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 it is the feeling that comes crawling up the back of your neck and makes the hair stand down there. You yeah, like this, yeah. You you gonna have one of them. That's that's good. Well, this story concerns some of the people I've I have mentioned to you. McCulloch walked into the laboratory into the uh, common room of this place in the evening. And there was Norbert Wiener sitting there, uh, reading, and Warren said, listen, uh, my colleague, whose name is Walter Pitts, and I have been considering the following problem. I'd like to discuss it with you. And Norbert says, okay, carry on, Warren. But Warren said, well, you've got all these blind people who can't see, oh, which is me. I'm trying to make a machine to enable them to read with their ears. Now, how would you do that? Any ideas? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a slick trick. Yes. <laughs> now he wants a machine to 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 look at the print. Uh, what he's saying is this. There's an I and there's an L. Mm -hmm. in print. Now, what we shall do is we will scan the print with a photoelectric cell, which, of course, can see, unquote. Now, the photoelectric cell is going to encounter this eye. Now, when this line is broken, it makes a sound. And when a different sound. So when you hit eye, it's going to go bonk, which, which is a distinctive sound of these two notes. When it picks up this level as well, it's going to go boing. <laughs> I can't do it, of course, as you notice. Um, and the idea then is that um, that clearly, well, wouldn't you? And then like, you've got an N, and that's going to go blunk, me, blunk. So one can see that this is a sort of possible thing to do. Now, what's the big snag? I mean, if you were if you were asked to put money into this, what would you say? <laughs> Pardon? Well, yes, but you could obviously. I mean, people can read braille, you see, so you could obviously train your ear to to, to hear it. I mean, uh, you know, you get Gestalten, wouldn't you? Get whole whole words like V would go, and you would say, "Well, that's the." You'd soon learn that. Nature, be a yes, so there's ambiguities to clear up, Patty, but but nobody's mentioning what the real problem is. You've got to scan it like a like a like a television. Ah, now we're getting near to it, exactly on the line. What's that mean? Well, it's position relative to the line. You can pick up part of one that the line built. Precisely. Line. Precisely. And the generalization of this problem is that type is different sizes and different spacing. Now, you could say, well, you better reprint everything on a standard format, but we've got that already. It's called Braille, and you don't, you don't need this. Yeah. So Warren uh, said, well, and then this is Warren talking to Norbert, you see. He said, look, if we have, um, I'll just draw what he drew. I have the privilege, you see, of having seen this diagram. Now, now the solid things are photoelectric cells, and the 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 um, circles are um, oscillators. So you you set up a vibration between a photoelectric cell and oscillator, and then along comes your scanner like this. Excuse me. These are your three lines, which are going to look at that. Now, you would obviously need a battery of these things, so let me put in some more. And this diagram gradually grew 
in front of Norbert <coughs> Wiener. And I'm just trying to, I mean, I don't expect you to bother with the technology of this, but I'm hoping I can make clear to you um, what this schematic looked like, because I want you to realize that this isn't a circuit, you see. It's, it's not an electronic circuit. It is a schematic diagram of how you would do this. Now, then we now have a bank of photocells and a bank of oscillators and a scanning apparatus, which is going to find out and make all these funny sounds. Now then, the problem of what on earth to do about the varying sizes of type was the thing that Warren now tells Wiener that he thinks he's solved. And what it involves is going across the thing like that. You have to find out where you are geometrically across these three lines, which is exactly addressed to the, the, the problem you immediately saw there. And so you would be doing something like that uh, both ways. And you've got something that looks roughly like that. No, that, that's more or less as, uh, I don't want to waste time on this diagram, but that's roughly what was drawn. And they discussed the problems of this and uh, it, whether it would work and so on. And they're mixing here the mathematics of the, um, the series produced by scanning, the electronics of how you how you do it, and the pattern recognition, which which would somehow give you the answer. So fine, Warren pours himself a large whiskey, if I remember Warren speaking of which, <clears throat> and um, goes off to bed. And this diagram is left on the table. Mm -hmm. Now, in comes Gert von Bonin. I haven't mentioned him yet. He is one of the leading world figures in neuroanatomy. He picks this up, and he says to Norbert Wiener, hmm, who's been trying to make a diagram of the fourth visual layer of the cortex? <laughs> Getting the frisson? I think it always happens to me. I, whenever I tell this story, it's just amazing, you know? Wow. Now, some people say so. <laughs> they don't get the frizzle. So I'm very glad to feel that maybe you have. Now, there's a bit more coming. Wiener was bowled over by this. And... So next time the group got together in the evening, at one of their regular meetings, he told the others what had happened. And he said, look, I could make a mathematical analysis of this so-called machine or this so-called bit of brain if I knew the rate, uh, excuse me, the, the, the rate at which nerve impulses are coming up here, you know, and... And all the, if I could quantify the diagram in short, so various people say, oh, I spent a lifetime doing that. I can tell you that the, 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 the impulses come in. And they did quantify the diagram. And Wiener did the math and said, I can now tell you what the scanning rhythm has to be. Any guesses? This is cycles a second. Any thoughts there? Pardon? Aha, uh -huh, that's a good, good answer. Not right, but uh, no, a <laughs> very good answer. It's 10 cycles. What is that? Anybody know? It is the alpha state of the brain. And you've heard of that, I expect, which is the resting rhythm of the brain is solemnly scanning this stuff at 10 cycles a second. Now, that's the second free song, huh? Now, you see, cybernetics is built out of those disclosures, out of those excitements. A wildly exciting subject, and now it's portrayed as something to do with artificial intelligence or whatever, you know, it's boring as hell. Um, the, the, 
whole thing I'm trying to get across to you is the interdisciplinary quality of this and mm -hmm. what happens if you, if you stir this pot of, uh, of specialities, specialties. So uh, they held these meetings and all sorts of things emerged. I suppose the most famous of the things that emerged is the notion of error-controlled negative feedback. Now, what this says is that if you are trying to do something, you constantly measure the extent to which you're not succeeding and feed that error signal back into the input. Now, pretty obvious when we say it like this, but it wasn't. And again, the interdisciplinary quality comes out because if, if you said, I mean, look at the terminology I'm using. Error-controlled negative feedback is a, is a term from server mechanics, from engineering. If you, if you have a, a power break and you stab the break, you've got feedback coming into the system. Now, you don't normally think of that in the social context, but you've got it all the same. And Warren says in one of the last papers he wrote before he died, one of the colleagues, that the whole essence of cybernetics is the lesson never do anything until you know the result of your last action. And again, you see, it's so devastatingly simple. But if you, if you look at uh, a modern government, for instance, I mean, it, just, it just makes you giggle. It makes me giggle to, to apply that uh, the criteria. I mean, it's goodness sake. So, um, out, uh, I was saying that all this stuff began to emerge. Now, Wiener, bless his cotton socks, had a tax problem. So Wiener wrote a book called Cybernetics. In 1948, it was published, in which he announced the discovery of a new science. And it's most amusing to me that he did do it for, to, to make a bit of money on the side. Now, where comes this word? They had, uh, they had decided that uh, they needed a term for, for the science of control. But you see, watch this word again. You know, I, I try to show you that it's a much more subtle use of the notion of control. Perhaps the word regulation is better. But again, that sounds like a bunch of bureaucrats, you see. So that we, we're short of words here, very short of useful words. At any rate, um, he chose the word cybernetics. Anybody got a clue of the origin of that word? Any philologists here? Greek is Kubernetes. And it means steersman. Now, that's interesting, you see, because they'd already realized that the notion of control, do this and he doeth it, or pull this lever and it goes clonk, 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 is too, too uh, simplistic. So... The idea of the steersman is that on uh, this word turns up in Homer, so it's it's very long established. It's the guy at the back of a long ship who is saying, "I want to go over to that light across the bay," and he's doing this, and he he steers towards the light. Now you know, if you said, "Well, the problem is, folks, uh, that we've got a sea running here and all these currents and uh, we've got winds and they change and they veer about and uh, you, you'd never get there, would you? I mean, nobody could solve the problem, not conceivably, not even today with computers and mathematics and the rest of it. Can you actually do that? Because the meteorological conditions are not well enough understood and probably never will be. What you do is you look there and you stare. So it was a very good choice of word from that point of view. From another point of view, it was a disaster because everybody said, what is cybernetics, before they were shot. <laughs> but it is a good word. Now, that word, steersman, as I say, it appears in Homer. Plato uses it for regulation in societies. So it's getting a nice uh, patina on it. Uh, it turns up in Latin. Now, if you think of, I don't know how interested you are in language, I presume some of us are, 
uh, the Greek kappa turns into a g, uh, a harder sound, and you get out of Kubernetes, you get gubernator in Latin, which of course gets into English as governor. Now, what do we know about governance, folks? We can draw, yes, but you see, there's various kinds, aren't there? Now, um, take a prison governor. I don't know, I'm into prisons today for some reason. Now, a prison governor has a lot of variables under his control, and they're called convicts. And if the prison governor goes off to have dinner with the mayor and so on, and the convicts dig a hole under the fence and uh, evaporate, um, too bad. And the first thing the governor knows is that he's having dinner with the mayor and he hears the bells clanging across Dartmoor or wherever saying somebody's got out. Now, that isn't a very clever method of control, is it? This gubernator, this prison governor, hasn't got a clue. Now, look at another governor. Have, have you ever heard of the Watt steam governor invented by James Watt with the kettle? How does that work? It's those two balls that twist round and float on. That's exactly it. It's worth, it's worth just uh, drawing that. I think it's sort of doing this. You, um, you have a shaft which is revolving like that, okay? And on this is a sleeve, and there are the two balls that uh, Lee mentions, and another sleeve. Now, as that uh, engine goes faster and faster, the centrifugal force drives the balls out when this sleeve moves up, doesn't it? And that shuts off the fuel. Now, that's damn neat, because it's what I call intrinsic regulation, the regulation is in the system. In other words, in the process of going out of control, it comes back into control, and you can have dinner with the mayor till the coming out of your ears, and it, it's going to work. Now, look at the difference between that and the prison governor, you see. Now, all our social systems fail, and I don't think that anybody in this room is going to have a fight about that. They fail, damn it. And they fail because they haven't got intrinsic regulation built into them. You're always trying to catch somebody out. Look at the Finance Act. Every year, the income tax <laughs> gets fatter and fatter and fatter with amendments to the Finance Act. Um, I, I, I know the lawyer who drove a coach and horses through the then Finance Act on behalf of um, Engelbert Humperdinck and Tom Jones. And there had to be a special act of Parliament to plug the gap. You know, you've got a whole profession of astute lawyers and accountants looking for loopholes, and then you try and plug them when it's too late. Now, this is no way, obviously, to go about the task of regulation, and a cybernetician wouldn't dream of it, obviously. I'm sure you can see that now. So the whole point is uh, to, to find the, the various kinds of mechanism which would be built into something so that the governorship the governance is a word I quite like because it doesn't sound so aggressive as control, will work. Well, now, Wiener wrote his book, 1948, published, and he defined cybernetics in the subtitle of the book a very interesting way. And you are now in the state of mind, I think, to, to understand this definition, which no, nobody else is. <laughs> He called it the science of control and communication in the animal and the machine. Now, people read that and they say, oh, yes, I wonder what that means, you know, obvious sort of something. Now, it isn't obvious at all, is it? Let's analyze it a bit. The first clause says control and communication. That is a recognition that all control, regulation, let's move the word as gently as possible, depends on the communications that affect it. And if someone cuts the wire, nothing's going to happen. I mean, in the crudest possible way. But in a non-crude way, we have a whole science, uh, a whole mathematical theory of communication now called information theory, which explains what has to happen to make 
the control system work. So, so now we've got intrinsic control, we've got the notion of feedback, and now we can see that everything is dependent on communication, which people hadn't realized. Secondly, in the animal and the machine. Now, that is devastating if you actually stop and think, because it is saying that the subject of biology and the subject of physics and engineering, which we always regarded as absolutely distinct, have much in common. Regulation across the animal and the machine. My godfathers, what are we talking about? It's contrary to all the setup that we are familiar with through our educational system. Terrifying. And of course, a lot of people are very uptight about it. They don't like to be told that there is any resemblance. They say, he thinks that I am some kind of computer. Well, I don't. <laughs> but what I do know is that you couldn't operate your body unless some of these things were in place. I'm going to pick this up, okay? It just succeeded. How have I done that? It's because there are circuits in the cerebellum here, and as my hand goes out, if, if I'm going to miss it, it pulls it back until I've, I've got it. And this, you can build a machine to do that. Of course you can. They don't have to go mad and say, but a machine doesn't have any ethics or something. This is, this is, yes, I know. We, we, you know. All that can be explored later. Let us first see what, what is common. Now, somebody who does this, and unfortunately, you know, some of those guys around, Parkinsonianism and so on, this is called ataxia. And, and it's the, the result of something going wrong in the cerebellum, which doesn't produce this error-controlled negative feedback, which is exactly the term that I used at the outset. So, I hope you're beginning to see the flavor of this thing. And that's 1943. 1948, the book comes out. Between, I think, uh, 46 and 56, these conferences are going on. So, this is the huge... Uh, excitement that's being generated inside science and, I may say, philosophy uh, by this, th this group of people. Now, I wish to introduce also the key Englishman in this is a man called Ross Ashby. Now, he was a psychiatrist, so another discipline coming in here, and he, he, was, he ran a, 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 a mental hospital in Bristol for a long time and then became the head of the Burden Neurological Institute in Bristol. And uh, then he, um, he went to Illinois, where Heinz von Foster was, the, the um, Biological Computing Laboratory, again, the, the attempt to put the words together, in Champaign-Urbana, uh, was where uh, Heinz von Foster operated. And so I now finish with a, an anecdote about... Uh, Ashby. Um, I was with, this is 1960 now, I was with Ashby in um, Illinois, and we, we had a most incredible conference uh, there of a similar kind with a group of very high-powered people. And um, we were in Heinz's house, and a uh, very extraordinary thing happened. Um, Heinz was trying to persuade me to emigrate to the United States and had offered me a professorship at Illinois. And I was loath to do anything about this. I had young kids, and I, I'm sorry, uh, Cassie, I, I couldn't face the idea of G-pop and you know, chewing gum and <laughs> <laughs> too English, you think. So, so I was resisting this like mad, and Heinz said to Ashby, Ross, you said not a word. Put your weight in here. Persuade Stafford. And Ross said, why should I? Nobody's ever offered me a professorship. <laughs> Deathly silence, you see. So uh, I said, we're serious. He said, no. And, and Hank said, well, we all thought you'd turn them down by the score. So nobody ever asked me. So in this frightful hush, Hank said, cleared his throat, and he said, Dr. Ashby, I formally offer you a chair in this university. And Ross said, thank you, I accept. And everybody was like this. 
<laughs> said, may I telephone my wife? And he went out and telephoned his wife. Now, her story is that he, he rang her and said, we're emigrating, sell the house. <laughs> <laughs> she never forgave him for it. He was a very strange man. They're all very strange, these people. You know, I'm the only sane one. <laughs> so um, so uh, the point of my story to, to crisp up Ashby for you, he's a very meticulous man, very dapper, little neat beard and striped trousers kind of character, well, psychiatrist, you know. <laughs> so we were walking by moonlight across this huge campus in Champaign to the faculty club where we had adjacent rooms, and, and I said, Ross, you know, really shattered everybody tonight, and he said, why? And I said, well, you know, if I were to criticize you, which God forbid, I would say you're a bit over meticulous, Ross. What's that supposed to mean? I said, well, I would have thought that you would have uh, said, give me three months, I will then list all the pros and cons, and I will make a balanced judgment. And Ashby stopped dead in the middle of this. I can see it as if it were yesterday, 1960. Stopped dead in the quadrangle, this big moon, and he said, what? <laughs> and he said, are you taking leave of your senses? He said... I, with three months, I couldn't do that in three years. It's impossible. It's an impossible assignment. You ought to have the sense to see that. So I said, well, it's difficult, yes, but uh, I mean, I've been trying to do it myself after all. Um, so I said, well, why did you just say yes? He said, there are only two things to do in that circumstance if you, if you don't have enough information, cybernetics, all that, you see. He said, you obey hunch. Now, the brain is a complicated piece of machinery and may produce the right answer. I can't account for it, but my brain said, do it. So I did. So we resumed walking, and I was trying, grappling with this. And then I said, uh, I stopped this time. And I said, okay, suppose you don't have a lunch. <laughs> What's the second most obvious thing to do? And he looked at me, pitying me, and he said, you toss a coin. <laughs> It's the only rational thing to do. Now, this, 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 is, this is one of the world's leading authorities on the brain. You see? <laughs> yeah, amazing people, all of them. Well, I just brought in myself because I wanted to tell you where I was in 1943 when all this began. Um, I was 16. The war was on. I had just escaped from school, which was driving me potty. Uh, because of reductionism, by the way, I was in six mathematics, and therefore I couldn't study Greek, which is what I most wanted to do, because the mathematician is not supposed to study Greek. I couldn't study French. I got round that by going to, uh, to classes to train as an interpreter, because all the parachutists were going to come down dressed as nuns. <laughs> that was the theory. So, so you know, I was, I was struggling to to do the things that interested me. And and kids can't, you know. I mean, I have eight children, and I've, I've tried to help them get through this bloody awful system in which you're forced to do this, that, and the other, and it's all carved up, and it's all reductionist. And I'm sorry for everybody present, including myself. So what I was saying was, in 1943, I escaped. I got into the university when I was 16, and I got into University College London, and the Germans promptly dropped a landmine on this. And I found myself in Aberystwyth, and I'd never been in Wales, and this is why I'm here now, because I fell in love with Ceredigion and the Welsh language and all sorts of things. Yeah, I fell in love with quite a lot of things, actually. Um, dear me, I'm misleading myself here. Uh, <clears throat> so... That's what I was doing. Now, I was, I was plucked out into the army and so on and so forth, and I got into operational research at the end of the war. And I found myself in uh, 1950, I was a head of operational research and production controller of the steelworks in Sheffield when I read Wiener's book. And I thought, my God, I'm a mathematician. I didn't know. <laughs> there it all was all laid out with bunches of mathematics, and it was wonderful. 
So I wrote to Wiener and the rest is history, you see, because I, I came to know all these people. And Warren McCulloch became my mentor, as I said. He used to visit me in, in Sheffield. I, in the late 50s, I was, uh, I was head of management science for the whole of United Steel. And Warren was very, very intrigued by, by what I did. And he used to came, come and stay at my house. And, and I met Heinz von Forster and so on. I met Wiener in 1960 by which time I'd written a book called Managerial Cybernetics. It was called Cybernetics and Management, but that was the foundation of what's become Managerial Cybernetics. And I've just written a 13th book on that. No, no. And you know, Einstein's big problem, if I dare say that, about a very great man was precisely that he wasn't interdisciplinary. He wasn't what? Interdisciplinary at all. Right. It was a real problem because it led him to all sorts of absurdities in in, uh, in physics because because he couldn't he couldn't get the illumination that he would have got from other topics, and other people have had to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the famous remark, God doesn't play dice, you know, with, he's yeah. faced with a stochastic universe, and yeah. Einstein never came to terms with that. But you see, the answer to that, you need to be a magician to see the answer to that, the answer to that is God is the dice, and there's no problem any longer. You know, there, there are ways of looking at things. Yeah? <laughs> Einstein, who they say, they say of him that although he, he indeed understood it was a very brilliant mind, but yet when, as you mentioned about somewhere in the, in the course of your talk, you were saying that uh, you can't do basic math and, and uh, taxes. I mean, Einstein just could not cope. No, no, no. With the addition and subtraction that is equivalent. No, no. Well, of course, uh, uh, that's right. But addition and subtraction have nothing to do with mathematics, you know. <laughs> that's arithmetic. <laughs> Well, quite a game to have known, you know. You sound like you're a great game. <laughs> game seems quite yeah. funny. Yeah. Well, they certainly yeah. were. Are there any more things up here that are still alive? Heinz's. The, the rest are dead. Ashby's dead. They all die at about 70, for some reason. The picture of Warren Cox must seem quite a stern. Yeah, he could look he could look stern. But Warren told the story about himself several times in print, and I, I've heard him tell it in person often. Um, his his he went to a Quaker college in the on the east coast somewhere I've forgotten where, and his professor was a, an eminent Quaker philosopher because he read philosophy originally, and the. Professor said to the young Warren, What do you want to do with your life? And Warren said, What is a man that he may know a number? And what is a number that he may be known by man? And the professor looked at him and said, Thee will be busy all thy life. <laughs> I've just published my 1960 diary. I've, it's the only time I've ever kept a diary in my life. It's my first trip to the States. Mm -hmm. It's 100 pages long. And it's in the, the new book that's just come out. Mm -hmm. uh, I was amazed to... I, I've forgotten I'd written it. it was, I'd totally forgotten. And it's absolutely fascinating because all my first, my first week meeting with Wiener and, and I gave 17 lectures and... Uh, I whizzed round and round the states. <laughs> it's absolutely unbelievable. And of course, there's an account of everything I was doing, you know, and, and things like I spent this morning on the world's largest computer. It's very interesting. It has 287,000 vowels. <laughs> Here we are, only 30 years later, you know. <laughs> you could put the whole damn thing in a fountain pen. <laughs> So, I don't know if that uh, diary would, would amuse you. It, it tells the story about Ashby, you see, the, the one under the moon, because that's where it happened. I hope that this kind of introduction is pleasing to you guys, because, uh, you know, I want you to try and grasp the excitement of it and these, these extraordinary g people that we're dealing with. 
And I knew, you see, if I, if I made a whole lot of notes and so on, we'd be here all week discussing the origins of cybernetics and uh, hence the story about the execution. Yeah, we, we, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be the official historian, but I do want to share my, my experience. Uh, these people.